Dorothy Borg Professor, Associate Professor in History of the U.S. following the Prime Minister's remarks. Let me acknowledge the distinguished members of the Malaysian delegation as well who are accompanying the Prime Minister this morning. Welcome to Colombia. Prime Minister Mahathir returned to the political fray in Malaysia last year after retiring from public office for 15 years and winning a rousing national election. He had previously been Prime Minister of the country from 1981 to 2003. In the short time since returning to the Prime Minister's office, Dr. Mahathir has been credited with putting an end to the prior regime's corrupt practices, confronting the exploding debt threatening the country, and describing a path forward, not only for Malaysia, but also for other Southeast Asian nations in a multilateral setting. As a 94-year-old leader, Dr. Mahathir has caused all of us to ponder the ways in which age can be powerful, carrying with it a broader perspective as well as the capacity to embrace competing ideas and challenging realities. Let me articulate what I mean by that. Dr. Mahathir has been present on the Malaysia's political stage for decades, leading a major party, and yet last year he led the first change in party power at the helm in Malaysia's government since 1957, the party that he had led previously. He has acknowledged the excellence of technology, Chinese technology, and urged the world to embrace China's technical prowess. At the same time, he decided, coming back to power, that the two massive infrastructure projects with China initiated by his predecessor, the East Coast Rail Link and a gas pipeline project were unfair and too costly and must be renegotiated. And he has formed a political alliance with and designated as his successor a former political adversary and an opposition leader. It comes as no surprise then that many members of our community particularly scholars of Southeast Asia and China, have looked forward to hearing from the Prime Minister. He's not only a national leader, but a figure of significance, certainly in his home country and beyond. And yet, he's also someone who has provoked deeply felt opposition on our campus for anti-Semitic statements, including comments made this past summer during his tour of British universities. This year, Malaysia banned Israeli athletes from participating in the World Para Swimming Championships that it was scheduled to host, and the International Committee felt obliged to move the event to another country. Clearly, such attitudes are absolutely contrary to what we stand for. In a letter to, uh, to several student groups that had expressed their concerns about Dr. Mahathir's visit to Colombia, President Bollinger offered this useful perspective. Open public engagement can sometimes be difficult, even painful. But to abandon this activity would be to limit severely our capacity to understand and confront the world as it is, which is a central and an utterly serious mission for any academic institution. Dr. Mahathir's subject this morning is rule of law and multilateralism, a topic dear to his heart and of utter importance in the region. But I'm also confident that he will address the full range of complex realities that he confronts today as the leader of the nation that he knows so well. Please join me in respectfully welcoming our guest today, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Dr. Mahathir bin Mohammed, who will make a statement. Thank you. Thank you. 
outside the conversation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm glad to be here to see so many people attending this uh, meeting, this forum, and I hope to be able to explain a little why a former head of a party decided after he had resigned as uh, Prime Minister, decided to uh, go against the very party that I left. Uh, I'm not loyal to the party. I'm loyal only to my country. If my own party does something that is wrong, I felt it was my duty to do something about it. More so when people came and asked me to do something about the governments which succeeded me. So doing something may take the form of advising, or demonstrations, but I decided to join the opposition uh, in order to bring down the uh, party I had led for more than 20 years. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, we were able to win because the party which ruled the country it was the same party which won the independence for the country and has been the government for more than 60 years, 61 years to be exact. Uh, and nobody really thought that this party would lose in any election because it's a powerful party, it's a crooked party, it is going to use all within its means to stay in power. But uh, fortunately for us, the uh, people decided that it was time the previous party should uh, step down and give way to a new party. Uh, they, so we won the election with a good majority, but uh, we won it uh, in a very peaceful manner. And many countries adopt the uh, democratic system, elections would lead to violence uh, because the losers uh, do not like to admit losing. They, want, they will accuse the government of foul play and therefore they will take to the streets to demonstrate or they go on strike or they become very violent. But in Malaysia, when the government party lost, there was no violence. The government party admitted that it had lost the election, reluctantly, of course, but it did. And after the election, uh, the new government was able to take over. And uh, the task for the new government is to make corrections to all the things that were done by the previous government, particularly with regard to uh, the embezzlement of government money, not by millions, but by billions of dollars. And uh, so now we are going through the task of trying to restore government finances, trying to store, restore good governments, to abolish many of the draconian laws that were passed by the previous government, and so far, we have uh, been able to do all this without uh, any um, violent protests. There were some protests, of course, but uh, they were not violent. The previous uh, Prime Minister has been charged in court. He is undergoing a trial. Uh, it has taken a long time. It's more than a year, but the trial is going on and will go on for quite some time before the court decides whether he's guilty or not. In the meantime, he's quite free. He's campaigning all over the country uh, and accusing the present government of the very same thing that he did. Uh, for example, uh, he ordered uh, uh, warships from China, and then he, he is now accusing us of being stupid for ordering ships from China. 
but it was he who ordered it. We are just caught by the contracts he had entered into. And as you know, contracts, uh, you cannot just reject. You have to abide by the terms of the contract. And uh, that has been a problem for us because we have, if we drop the, the contract, we have to pay compensations, lots of money. So instead of that, we have decided that uh, we should reduce the amount by maybe reducing the scope and renegotiate with the uh, uh, Chinese contractors. They have been uh, quite obliging because with regard to the East Coast Railway, they have um, reduced the cost by about 20 billion Malaysian ringgit. 20 billion Malaysian ringgit is about uh, uh, five, 5 billion Malaysian uh, US dollar. So that's the position now. And we are still hard at work trying to restore the economy of the country, trying to restore good governance, etc. And uh, I think with that, uh, you will know enough about what I'm doing. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was going to um, steer the conversation a little bit to multilateralism, um, which is the topic um, that you would put forward for us today. Uh, as a historian, I'm really interested um, in change over time. Uh, so Dr. Mahajra, I, my question for you is, uh, since you um, have entered political office, and this is really since Merdeka, uh, since Malaysian independence, my question is how has your vision, and really Mal Malaysia's vision, of multilateralism evolved during this period? Well, uh, it, we have been able to set up good, gov good governments uh, with participation of almost all the communities in Malaysia. Now, Malaysia is a multiracial country. We have three major races, Malays, Chinese, and Indians, and we have about 30 different tribes. Uh, the way to go, of course, is to get everybody involved. So in the government, from the very beginning, we had members of, par members of parliament and members of the cabinet, uh, coming from all the different races and tribes. And that is, I believe, multilateralism because the uh, indigenous Malays were in the majority. They could have seized power by themselves, and this was what uh, the colonialists suspected we would do, but we didn't. When we became independent, we decided to share the country with all the people in the country, including those descended from immigrants and, and the different tribes, share with them and in a very, uh, well, democratic way, I think, uh, we, we share the power to rule the country. And I think that would constitute multilateralism. That definitely does. Um, in this pluralistic society, you've laid it out really well that um, in terms of you know, the Bumiputra being in the majority, that they didn't seize uh, control through, um, through violence. And this is really interesting. My, uh, I'll steer it towards uh, foreign relations. So in terms of multilateralism um, and your view of multilateralism and how that has evolved uh, through your uh, term in political office um, at first in 1957, and then when you served as prime minister, um, in both terms more recently. Um, how has multilateralism changed in terms of Malaysia's position within the region? Well, we have always believed in uh, solving things through negotiation, arbitration, or court of law. Uh, if we had uh, espoused multilateralism, we would have uh, to solve uh, problems through confrontation, even war, because uh, you have to use force in order to uh, settle the problem. But we have never done that. Instead, we have uh, de negotiated with our neighbors. So in the case of Thailand, the negotiation was very fruitful. We decided in the area of the sea that is claimed by both of us, 50% uh, of whatever we produce there would belong to one party and the other 50% to the other party. In the case of uh, claims on a small rock 
by Singapore and Malaysia, we decided to go to the World Court. And the World Court wrongly But in the case of the claim on two beautiful islands off the coast of uh, um, uh, Malaysia in Borneo, uh, the court decided that the islands belong to us. A very wise decision. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Pick, uh, picking up on that, what do you think are the uh, present challenges to Malaysia and multilateralism in the region? And here I'm thinking of, um, in particular, uh, rising China, um, and then also in terms of uh, US policy towards the region. Yeah, when we are dealing with very powerful countries, uh, we have to accept that we are not going to be able to go to war with them. Uh, we, in many instances, we have to give in. Uh, somebody said that the strong will take what they will, the weak will yield what they must. And sometimes we uh, yield, yield it as much as we can uh, without hurting ourselves. So, for example, uh, China has claimed the South China Sea as belonging to China, and now they have this uh, um, one, 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 this new thing. It's all right for them to claim, as long as they allow ships to pass through, even warships to pass through, they can claim the seas anyway. If I could pick up on that, uh, in terms of uh, the Malaysia's foreign policy and its uh, promotion of non-militarization of the waterways, um, what do you see as um, ASEAN's role um, in really pushing forward this? Is there more that um, the regional organization that Malaysia helped found, um, is there more that ASEAN could do? Well, uh, the effect of gr uh, grouping is to give strength to us. Uh, one single country cannot defend itself, especially a weak country like us. Of all the countries of Southeast Asia, it is not an, an economic association. It's not like the European Union. The problem uh, with us when we all became independent was that uh, there was uh, some confrontation between uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. And to avoid this violence, we decided that if we form an association of all the Southeast Asian countries, then all the leaders can sit around a table and discuss problems and solve the problem around the table, rather than confrontations and wars. What do you see as ASEAN, if I could continue in this question about ASEAN, and I, I appreciate the uh, your discussion of the origins of ASEAN, the, uh, the initial uh, mission of ASEAN. Uh, I guess if I could push you a little bit further in terms of um, the current composition of ASEAN, uh, what do you see as its strengths and weaknesses uh, in terms of this you know, regional alliance in confronting the challenges, not just you know, posed to Malaysia, but as a region as a whole? Well, uh... The association is made up of countries at different stages of development. Uh, some are uh, rather uh, uh, not well developed. Uh, some are very well developed, can be even considered as developed countries. So when there is an association of unequals, uh, it takes uh, some um, uh, diplomacy to retain the relationship and not to hurt anybody. So through the ASEAN forum and ASEAN meetings uh, of heads of state, we were able to appreciate the problems of the poor and the need for them to be helped. And uh, this uh, we try to do so that they do not feel that they are the underdog, uh, that they have equal uh, grouping. And so far it has worked. As one of the stronger members in ASEAN with a very um, 
a strong economy, 6% and growing per annum. Um, what do you, what, what advice could you uh, impart to, the, uh, to Vietnam? And this is, of course, a country near and dear to my heart as I'm from Vietnam. Oh. Uh, when it chairs ASEAN yeah. uh, next year, what, what, um, what do you see the role of the stronger nations in ASEAN being able to do? We would like to think that we provide a model of how a poor country can develop. And I think uh, Vietnam has been looking around the world and maybe looking also at Malaysia and Malaysia's uh, record. And uh, Vietnam realizes that in order to grow, you have to interact with the rest of other countries. Uh, in particular, Malaysia had uh, grown very well through foreign direct investments. And uh, now uh, Vietnam has adopted the same uh, strategy and because of that, uh, Vietnam now is uh, catching up with Malaysia and may outtrip Malaysia. Thank you. If I could uh, move the questions towards now that we've covered sort of local Malaysian politics um, as well as move towards uh, discussing the region, if I could think more globally, and I think this is a good opportunity to do this, um, given your recent statements about multilateralism, the threat to multilateralism uh, in the global arena, if I could ask you to expand on that, what do you think um, are the challenges to multilateralism uh, in terms of, of the global context? Well, the, changes, the challenges to multilateralism is unilateralism. That there are some powerful countries which do not consider the, the feelings or the thinking of other countries, but because of uh, its strength, has decided to make decisions and do things on its own, in its own interest, without due regard for others uh, who are affected by whatever it is that they do. Um, that's the, and these are directly from your comments a few weeks ago. Um, I was also thinking about, you know, if you could, if you could focus on, on Malaysia and the sort of global challenges um, that are presented. And here I'm thinking about the haze. Um, if you could talk about sort of what could be done uh, in terms of, of what I think is one of the most pressing challenges to uh, not just that you know Malaysia is confronting, uh, but all nations of the world. But I think this is going to impact Southeast Asia the most in terms of, of climate change. Yeah. Well, we know the haze is caused to burning uh, forest fires. Big forest fires uh, give off a lot of smoke and dust, and the wind blows the dust all over the place. And since our neighbor has got this problem of uh, burning forests, uh, a lot of the wind, a lot of the smoke and dust gets uh, blown to Malaysia. And so we have to suffer from haze. I would admit that even in Malaysia, there are some burning forests, but we have taken care of them. We have uh, all the necessary uh, uh, facilities for putting out fires, and we have done that. And uh, we hope that our neighbors would allow us to help them to put out fires so that they will not suffer from the haze, and we will also be freed from the haze. That is uh, our attitude to them. But on the other hand, of course, every country has a right to refuse help, and I think there is nothing we can do. I think I'm going to move into my last question, and if I could ask the students uh, to start lining up um, and to prepare themselves for the next um, segment of, of the event. Uh, my question is, I mean, I see Malaysia, and again, as a historian, um, of really sort of championing uh, multilateralism in terms of, as we already discussed, the, the formation of ASEAN, um, you know, its role in the non-aligned movement uh, in terms of the OIC. So I wonder if you could, um, in, my, in my, this final question, sort of talk about uh, Malaysia's future in, uh, in, in multilateralism um, and these sort of, uh, these organizations that Malaysia has been such a, um, either a, 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 you know, at the creation as a, a pivotal member in these organizations, um, sort of what, what role do you see Malaysia playing 10 years down the road? Yeah. If you look into the past, there were times when countries could actually remain isolated from other countries and be independent, uh, pro providing its own food and other needs. But today, the world is interconnected. 
the world, the world has become very small. Uh, communication is very good, both uh, com in terms of uh, communication, tele telecommunication, as well as travel. You, you can fly from Malaysia to Kunming. You are not sure of arriving. So the world, whether you like it or not, yes. the world has become small and you have become neighbors of each other. And uh, you cannot ignore your neighbor. Because if uh, they decide to burn their forest, you're going to be affected. If they decide not to trade with you, you also lose out. So other, what other countries do has an effect on other countries. So multilateralism is something unavoidable now. Uh, you cannot uh, be alone and independent of other countries. So acknowledging that uh, Malaysia having been a trading nation for a long time uh, decides that the, the world, the bigger world would become a bigger market for us. Instead of domestic market or regional market, now we have the whole world as a market. And because the whole world has become a market, it is important that all the countries of the world uh, remain at peace and stable and is able to become a trading partner for us. Uh, we trade with more than 190 different countries and we have grown because of trade. And when there is any attempt to stop trade, to, uh, to uh, apply sanctions and the like, that is very negative. Uh, when you apply sanction, it means not only is the, the country chosen uh, to be sanctioned suffers from uh, inability to trade, but we also suffer because we cannot trade with that particular country. Yet we have done no wrong to that country. We have no, done no wrong to the applicant, the people who applied the sanction. So it's all very negative. It doesn't contribute towards uh, well-being or the wealth creation in this world. So we are all for multilateralism. But of course, there should be certain rules uh, that must govern whatever it is that we do. But uh, those, those rules should not restrict trade, it should promote trade. Thank you, I chose 10 years um, on purpose because of uh, what, we've, what you have projected for Malaysia by 2030. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I mean, this has been uh, fascinating uh, for me uh, to be able to talk to you because I think as the um, eldest living member in terms of head of, as, as head of state, we do have, um, you know, we have a lot of, of, of wisdom we can draw from you. So at this point, I'm going to ask the students if they have questions um, to please line up um, at the microphone. And depending on how many, I might uh, we might do two at a time. One, one at a time. Please. One at okay, one at a time. Yes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, hello, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you for coming to Colombia today. Thank you. My question for you today is: What is your view on the Rohingya crisis, and what do you think can be done about it? Thank you. Well, that is very unfortunate. Uh, we had always been very friendly with Burma uh, during the time when Aung San Suu Kyi was uh, confined to her house. We sympathized with her. We did campaign to get her released. But now we find that she is not standing up for other people who are distressed. Uh, we had hoped that she would not back her government, but apparently she uh, has not because she cannot or she would not. But the thing is that nowadays, despite uh, our talk about freedom, about um, the world uh, trying to abolish war and all that, we find that when a country carries out such uh, atrocities, there's practically nothing we can do. You may remember that in Cambodia, uh, the government uh, killed two million people and the whole world stood by, did nothing. Uh, until, of course, uh, the Cambodians themselves uh, somehow the, rather managed with the help of Vietnam to, to get back to overthrow 
the Pol Pot regime. Uh, but in the case of Myanmar, there seems to be no Myanmar people wanting to overthrow this government, uh, wanting to take the risk and fight against the government so as to uh, remove a government that is obviously very cruel. Uh, and the whole world cannot do anything either. If Myanmar says, you cannot come to my country, you just don't go. Uh, you cannot, uh, you know something wrong is being done there. So there is a, ver a very clear weakness in the United Nations in that when it uh, sees um, a government being uh, absolutely brutal towards its own people, uh, we can do nothing. Uh, we can preach, we can pray, we can uh, uh, ask them, please don't do such things but they can continue doing it because uh, we don't invade countries to remove uh, such regime. However, having said that, one has to remember that uh, when Saddam was accused of killing people or being a dictator, uh, the, well, the US went in to remove Saddam and indeed Saddam was eventually hanged. <coughs> but in the case of Myanmar, uh, it seems that nobody wants to invade Myanmar and uh, overthrow the government. So for a long, long time, the people in Rakhine, Rakhine State will have to suffer. Uh, they cannot go back because they are afraid of the military there, which has uh, uh, been treating them very badly. So we are really not in a position to help people uh, in this modern world uh, despite the fact that we talk about human rights and the like. Thank you. Okay, the next question, I mean, I've just failed in my role as moderator because I forgot to remind the students to please introduce themselves first. Um, hello, uh, my name is Zachary Richards. Thank you, Prime Minister, for coming. Um, uh, I just had one two-part question. Um, so what are some of the current efforts to minimize racial tension in Malaysia, as there's been a history of this. And what do you think countries such as the US and uh, countries in Europe could learn from what Malaysia has done to help uh, solve these issues? Yeah, we have three different races, 30 different tribes in Malaysia. We have tried to uh, be fair to all of them. But uh, the different people have got different cultures and different uh, capabilities. Uh, we find that some are very well adapted towards uh, uh, capitalism, for example, and they have benefited. They have become, this particular race has become very, very rich, leaving the others behind. Now, as you know, if there is a great disparity between rich and poor, there will always be tension. The reason why we had socialism and communism before was because of the uh, disparity between rich and poor. Now, if the disparity of between rich and poor is amplified by being of different races, the tendency towards violence would be much greater. We cannot change the race of the people, but we can change their economic performance, for example. So we help the weak to catch up with, uh, with the... the, the the rich community. That was what we were doing through uh, affirmative action. But some people still do not want to accept that there need to be, have to be some corrective action taken. Uh, they are opposed to it. And uh, well, some even claim that they have been discriminated against. But if you find uh, a, a person far ahead and you are trying to catch up with him, you have to give uh, some kind of uh, uh, advantage to the one who is left behind to catch up with. Uh, but if you treat equally every, everybody, uh, it is the successful, successful community that is going to benefit most. The unsuccessful one, especially those who are not uh, well versed with commerce and industry, they are going to be left behind even further. Uh, that has to be prevented because if you have that, one day there will be clashes between rich and poor, between race and race. That is what we have been trying to do. 
But we have been accused of discriminating against the rich. Uh, well, uh, maybe it is discrimination because without discriminating against the rich, you can never help the poor to catch up with the rich. If you give the rich all the um, opportunities, they are going to search far ahead and leave the poor behind. So that is what we are trying to do, and uh, it has been difficult because the poor are poor because they do not have that skill to use uh, opportunities and capital to, uh, to grow their wealth. Uh, so we have to give them certain consideration. We have to train them, we have to educate them, we have uh, even to protect them. That, that is what is happening in Malaysia. I don't know, even in the US, as you know, at one time there was affirmative action in favor of the blacks, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, whites objected because they say this is discrimination, and so it was dropped. Thank you. Hi, my name is Min Min, I'm from Malaysia, and I want to talk about the Bumi Putra policy that you're talking about. So we know that for decades we have instituted this affirmative action for the Malays, but we also know for decades it has been ineffective. The Malays are still the poorest and also the most unequal group. The majority of the top 20% of the country are Malays and the poorest people are also the Malays. We know that it has institu institutionalized a system of patronage because preferential licenses given to Malays, you know, lead to Malay taking the licenses because of their race excess and then they, they sell it to other subcontractors for a higher price. So we see rent-seeking behaviors. We know that preferential quotas for education lead to lower competitive competitiveness and the achievement gap between academic performance is still there even though affirmative action is supposed to help. So it's been ineffective and your government has promised to ratify international human rights um, treaties yeah. and to, you know, so I'm wondering what will your government do differently? And we also, I admire you very much and you're really old. I'm also wondering, <laughs> I, I'm wondering, you know, beyond, you're, you're such a key figure to Malaysia, so beyond your tenure, what do you think is the future trajectory for Malaysia? Because this kind of reform will take a very long time, so how do you think we will go uh, forward in the future? Yeah. Well, what happens to Malaysia in the future depends very much on you, on your understanding of the situation. The fact is that uh, the Malays are very far behind the Chinese. Chinese are very good. I mean, that Chinese are backed by 4,000 years civilization. But the affirmative action policy is not helping them. It's... it's no, let, let me answer first. <laughs> it, to say it is not helping them is not correct. Many are helped and many have succeeded. For example, before when you give scholarship, you give to only the top student. We decided to give to number two, number three, number four, and they have performed. Today, for example, in the medical profession, when we started, there were only 2% of the doctors in Malaysia who were Malays. Now there are 40%. These are people who were considered non eligible for uh, scholarships because they did not perform with the highest uh, result, best result. So we gave even the people who are not, not the best, but who appears to be able to do things, we gave them an opportunity and because of that, we have corrected the imbalance, at least in the medical profession. In other professions too, we have made quite a lot of correction. Not satisfactory, but at least we have made some correction. And there are now Malays who are doing quite well in business. I was talking to a man last night. Uh, he, uh, he flies helicopters and he owns a lot of helicopters, not only in Malaysia, but all over the world. He was given a chance, and he made good use of the chance. Now, what happened before was that we were giving uh, uh, opportunities very freely, without considering their capability. I did try to give only to those who can succeed. But if they have already succeeded, then we help them. But when we help them, 
I was accused of cronyism. Uh, apparently, if you don't want to be accused of cronyism, you must ensure that everybody fails. Because lots of people fail, they are not my cronies. They are not accused of being my cronies. But those who succeed are all called my cronies. So how do you correct such things when you, if you succeed, then you are wrong. If you fail, then you are right. I that think is, it requires transparency okay. in the system. Sorry. Yeah, we, we, uh, can I actually yeah. get a time check? I think our screen's up here, and I w we have such long lines of students. Yeah. Um, could someone just give me the amount of time? Right. Now, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Now, great, great. to be very selective uh, to, to uh, overcome this uh, uh, habit of selling contracts, selling. Uh, contracts and other uh, uh, opportunities given to them, we want to ensure that those who got the contract will carry it out, carry out the contracts. If they don't, taking back the contracts. We are not going to allow them to sell licenses, contracts to others. That is to avoid what you said just now, that some people have uh, benefited wrongly. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the contracts given to the Malays uh, there were no Malays willing to buy, they had to sell to the Chinese. So it becomes worse. So now we want to ensure that if they get a contract or they get a license or whatever, they must make use of the contracts and license. And the, the one thing that we need to accept is that something has to be done. If you do away with affirmative action, what do you want to do? Nothing. If you do nothing, the disparity is going to be worse and there will be tension as between races and between the rich and poor. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Uh, very good morning, Tun. Uh, my name is Saiful. Uh, I'm also from Malaysia. I'm a Master's of International Affairs student here in Colombia. Uh, my question to you is in regards to institutional reforms in Malaysia. Um, I would like to echo what you said earlier. I thought um, it was a huge history in Malaysia. poster boy of kleptocracy to a beacon of democracy overnight. I think uh, the peaceful transition of power was uh, uh, plotted all over the world. And there was even an article in The Economist, I think, the following week, saying how um, the opposition never win election in Southeast Asia. But this man, being you, just did. And so with that huge... Um, uh, with that hu come huge expectation on institutional reforms. So, my, 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 I would like to pick your brain on what do you think is the, the most, uh, the top three par priorities in terms of institutional reforms in Malaysia, and what are the main challenges that uh, your government is facing right now in implementing those um, institutional reforms? Thank you. Well, the first thing, the first thing we uh, uh, tried to do and have done, in, in fact, is to give strength to the agency that is uh, focused on corruption. Uh, we give uh, independence to that agency and they have access to all information needed so that they can take action against corrupt people. And at this moment, we don't find any more of those corrupt practices that was uh, rampant during the last uh, regime. Uh, secondly, we believe in the rule of law. Uh, in the past, uh, the, law was, uh, the law was bad, and it is again being abused by the government. People are charged under laws that does not uh, relate to whatever crime they may have uh, committed, simply because they appear not to support the government. Uh, action was taken upon them under SOSMA and the like. And also, we find that... Um, the management of funds is very important. Um, Malaysia actually had been quite well off. Uh, we did not have a financial problem for six, for, well, a long time, a very long time. But now we have this terrible uh, problem because the previous government borrowed one trillion ringgit, one trillion ringgit. Uh, I mean, in the, divide by four, you'll get the uh, U.S. equivalent. And to repay a loan of one trillion ringgit is not easy. Uh, if you pay from the, 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 collects, the taxes that you collect, then you deprive other, other areas from being 
they are well financed. We have to finance the operation, of course. The salaries have to be paid, and statutory payments must be paid. But uh, what suffers is uh, development expenditure. We have to take money from development in order to pay off our debt. And it's going to be around for almost 30 years, unless, of course, we can find some means of reducing the, the debt. And that we are trying to do by, of course, trying to track where the money has gone to. Uh, the money has been stolen. If they had been invested, we would have uh, go, gone to the company concern and get the money back, uh, or diverse, diverse. But uh, we don't know where the money has gone to, uh, billions of dollars. And uh, they are refusing to, to explain where they, they, they have given the money. Uh, but I, I, I think they know where the money is. But uh, because we cannot, we have to continue to pay, we have to find some of our assets and sell them uh, in order to raise money to pay for our debt. So we have been able to reduce the debt a little. Well, the ceiling is fixed by the GDP. Now, when the GDP grows, of course, uh, the percentage comes down. The percentage of debt against the GDP comes down. And uh, over the years, perhaps, uh, we will find that the borrowings, though very big, will come below the 55% of GDP, which is the ceiling for our borrowing. So a lot of things are being done with the institutions. We are also making sure that the police is clean up. We have a police commission now, which will look into the performance of the police and uh, make inquiries if necessary. A lot of things have been done. And uh, I think uh, we, you will see the result very soon. In fact, with regard to uh, corruption, uh, much of that has been reduced. Uh, nobody, nobody now asks for payment over the counter in order to do a job for you. Thank you, Tun. And personally, thank you. Thank you. I'm exercising my right to free speech. Why is it that I can't say something against the Jews when a lot of people say nasty things about me and about Malaysia, and I didn't protest, I didn't demonstrate? Well, we have to be willing to listen to views which are not uh, in our favor because of free speech. Free speech is about free speech. When you say, no, you cannot say this, you cannot be anti-Semitic, then there is no more free speech. You must remember that one English uh, journalist was jailed for three months for disputing the numbers who, uh, who died during the Holocaust. Well, I, I have not disputed them, but I have said that uh, who, who, uh, who determined these numbers? Uh, if it is uh, somebody who is in favor, you get uh, one figure. Somebody who is against, you get another figure. So I accept that there was a Holocaust, that there were many Jews killed. And in fact, at one time, I was very sympathetic towards them during the war, when you were not around. But I was around at that time. And we were very... My grandmother was in the Holocaust, so she was around. Okay, thank you. I think I've said enough. Hi, Tun. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chung Heng Lee. I'm currently a senior at Columbia. Uh, welcome to Columbia. Uh, so I think the previous question was very tough. My question is much easier. Um, I would like to know what are your views on China's role in shaping ASEAN? Well, China now is a big power. Uh, you deal with a weak power or a power that is equal to your own power differently. 
You see, the Malay states have been around for more than 2,000 years. They have always been surrounded by very powerful countries. Thailand, Myanmar, or in this case was Burma and China. But uh, we were never conquered by others, except by the British, of course. We were never conquered, but that is because we learned how to deal with powerful countries. Uh, with China and Thailand, we used to sell, send them every year uh, flowers of silver and gold. And that uh, enables uh, us to be left alone. And we survive as Malay states. So now we have to deal with this great, powerful country, China. Uh, we don't propose to go to war with China. But we want to be friendly with them. And uh, we don't necessarily, unnecessarily annoy them. Uh, we try to have good relations with China. Uh, they claim that uh, the whole of South China Sea belongs to them. That is their claim. Uh, so long as they allow ships to pass through, that's OK. Uh, we can also claim uh, that uh, Australia belongs to us. But Australians won't care, you see, because it's not going to happen. So we hope that uh, by not disputing their claim, but uh, extracting the best we can out of their claim, I think we will benefit. It means that the South China Sea in the Straits of Malacca is necessary for East-West Strait. You close that, China itself will suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you um, to Dr. Mahathir for coming to speak to us today. As a Malaysian-American, I'm very excited to see you in person. Um, my, co uh, my name is Desmond, and I'm a junior at Columbia College. Um, my question pertains to the issue of the haze that's affecting Malaysia for the summer months. Um, you previously said that um, if Indonesia refuses help from Malaysia to clean up the forest, there's nothing you can do. But given the gravity of the situation, don't you think it's more prudent to have stronger action, for example, economic sanctions or leveraging the international community to speak out against Indonesia? And may I uh, understand like, what your thinking on that is? Thank you. Yeah, you can blame Indonesia, you can uh, criticize them, say Nazi things about them, but if they continue to have their fires, you will still have the haze. As you know, the new president of Brazil believes in burning the forest uh, to, for more agriculture. Uh, nobody has stopped him yet. So I, I think the system doesn't allow us to interfere in the internal affairs of countries. There will come a time when these uh, uh, burnings is so severe that the whole world will be enveloped by the haze. At that time, I think uh, the United Nations might say that, well, this is not a national problem. This is not a, a domestic affair. This is a problem for the world. And if it is a problem for the world, the world should exercise the right to take action. If we have that uh, uh, frame of mind, then we can do something when somebody uh, refuses to accept help for putting out fires, for example. And also, if people kill their own people, I think the whole world needs to do something about it not just say, well, this is a domestic right to kill people. That, that is not on. So at this moment, the UN can do nothing, but uh, we should try persuasion. I think the, the Indonesians are suffering very much. Uh, they have a figure of 1,000 or so uh, particles in the, uh, in the haze, and they are suffering. Uh, perhaps uh, then they will be more serious about controlling fires in their country. I was flashed the five-minute mark a few minutes ago, so I think this might be our final question for today. Uh, hello, thank you so much for coming over. Uh, I'm Itizaz from Pakistan. And uh, you are praised equally in Pakistan as you are praised in Malaysia. And because of Imran Khan, he always praises you. And I think he won election, like giving your examples. But at this time, um, we see him like standing alone on the Kashmir issue, where 8 million people are jailed in their houses by Indian regime. 
And um, do you think that while you're here uh, with the umbrella of ASEAN, you can step forward to collectively support the Kashmir cause at United Nations? Because United Nations has accepted it as not like the internal issue of India or Pakistan, but a, like global issue. Can you like talk about that, please? And the problem is that we don't respect the United Nations. Uh, big countries, powerful countries, just disregard the United Nations and the re resolutions that they make. When the big countries disregard the resolutions of the UN, small countries would follow suit. So now we are, what we are seeing in this world is that even small countries like Myanmar can thumb its nose at the United Nations and because we are helpless to do anything. So we are see, what we are seeing now is that uh, resolutions made by the United Nations do not seem to uh, affect the thinking or the policies of any country. As you know, uh, there is a resolution on, on Kashmir, Jammu Kashmir, in the United Nations, and people should respect. If you don't respect, one day you will be suffering from disrespect of other resolutions. So we feel that uh, we, we, can, we cannot go to war with them, we cannot ask the world to invade India. So what we can do now is to appeal to India to go back to the resolutions of the United Nations, then we will have a much more peaceful nation, uh, country and world. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that is all we have time today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Esteemed guests, please remain seated.